Hello everyone, I'm Jeremy Mogtater and I'm the program manager for the University of Michigan Campus Farm. Uh, we are a student-driven and student-managed part of the Mathai Botanical Gardens uh, that creates a living learning laboratory environment for sustainable food systems, uh, collaborating on high impact and authentic teaching and learning, uh, as well as research uh, with many of the folks in this room. Um, we focus on having food grown by food students for students, which you can find available in some of the residence halls as well as the retail locations on campus and part of the reception that you'll be uh, attending after the talk this evening. I have the great pleasure of introducing this evening Brendan O'Neill. He is a microbial ecologist. He will be starting officially uh, this December as a research scientist here in the uh, School of Environment and Sustainability. He is, as of two weeks ago, a brand new dad. Congratulations, Brendan. And his favorite food, quote unquote, by far and away, is popcorn. <laughs> and I've had his popcorn, and I can attest that it's very good. So you do a good job. Um, the title of his talk is, What Do Soil Microbes Have to Do With Food Sustainability? Brendan O'Neill. Thanks, Jeremy. So, what do soil microbes have to do with sustainable food? As a microbial ecologist, I study the interactions of microbes with their environment and with other organisms. Today, I will touch on just one aspect of how, how microbes influence the sustainability of our food systems. I'll start with a very big picture. Here is a current version of our tree of life. For reference, I'm. Uh, for reference, here are animals, fungi, and plants in the bottom corner, and homo sapiens. <laughs> <laughs> and then this vast array of other diversity that we often don't think about when we walk into nature. Where do we find this diversity? Here's one nice summary from Thompson et al. On the y-axis, we have number of species, basically. And on the x-axis, we have different types of habitats. So for example, here we have the animal gut. There's a lot of interest in the animal gut right now in the human gut microbiome. Here in blue, we have the diversity in different fresh and marine environments. But by far and away, the largest amount of diversity is found here in the rhizosphere around plants and in soils and sediments. Despite the charisma of habitats like coral reefs and tropical forests, probably the most biologically diverse habitat on Earth is beneath our feet, intertwined in roots, in soils, and in sediments. And it's no coincidence that these habitats and the landscapes on top of them play a major role in our current climate crisis. Greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, forestry, and other land uses are as big as those from the electricity sector and far bigger than the transportation, transportation sector. Why? Because carbon in gaseous forms is flowing out of the soils because of the way that we manage them. Three principal green ga greenhouse gases that we think about, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, flow out of soil ecosystems, and all of them are generated or consumed as part of micro metabolic processes carried out by soil microbes, which have acted as key regulators for these gases. My research into this world began as an early graduate student, studying a unique ecosystem in the central Amazon. Here, prior to European contact, indigenous communities enriched soil with charcoal, bone, shell, and other inputs, which sustained settled agriculture on what <clears throat> which sustained settled agriculture on what we now term anthropogenic soils. Remnants of these soils, essentially part of an ancient food system, are still being uncovered in forests throughout the Amazon. We can directly compare the properties of these, these unique soils compared to adjacent soils that are unmodified. The anthropogenic soils, seen in black here, have increased soil organic matter and after hundreds and thousands of years have retained or even gained carbon and nutrients. Compared to the unmodified soils, here in yellow, the microbes we isolated from these soils were more diverse and distinct in their composition. The anthropogenic soils had, incre 
oops, um, were more diverse in their composition. For example, the anthropogenic soils shared an abundance of proteobacteria and actinobacteria taxa, which tend to thrive in carbon-rich environments and likely help retain and ultimately sequester more atmospheric CO2. This is an exciting example of an indigenous practice leading to a sustainable system. But what about soils that are closer to home, on landscapes indicative of those contributing to the emissions that we see in the IPCC data above, in the data above? Here's the principal crop in the US, in the US Midwest and in Michigan, <clears throat> grown in vast monocultures for just a few months out of the year with the soil being left bare for the rest of the year. <coughs> in, terms, in terms of acreage, this represents the majority of our modern food system, where we optimize yield of a single commodity at the cost of creating a healthy soil ecosystem with microbial communities that help build soil organic stocks. The obvious question is, how can we change these soil habitats to retain and sequester carbon? We can change inputs specifically the amount of plant diversity on our landscapes, including, including perennial cover, cover into our agricultural systems, which supply carbon via photosynthesis year-round, which soil microbes in turn convert into stock soil carbon. We conducted a long-term study in western Michigan examining the effects of adding cover crops to crop rotations in, that included corn. These soils not only gained carbon each year, but we found that the bacteria that thrived most in these habitats were again species of proteobacteria and actinobacteria, which rapidly draw carbon back into the soil. We know how to cultivate soils, soil environments, with soil microbial communities that sequester carbon. And on existing cropland, increasing by just 0.4% a year, the quantity of carbon contained in soils, we can halt the annual increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. In other words, big solutions to the current sustainability crisis come in small packages. <clears throat> By changing our land use and management practices to harness soil microbes, we can create sustainable food systems. Thanks.